Hello, everyone. Happy Black History Month. And thank you for joining our 2024 Black Owned Summit hosted by Grow with Google and the U.S. Black Chambers Incorporated. This is our fourth annual summit, and we are excited to be here and have a fantastic schedule today packed with resources to help you take your businesses to the next level. Don't forget, you can turn on YouTube's closed captioning by clicking on the closed captioning button directly on the video player on your screen. My name is Angelina Darasaw, and I'm Grow with Google's national digital coach and CEO of C-Suite Coach. So I'm a business owner just like you, and all of our coaches are small business owners too. Small businesses are the backbone of this country, whether it's your local barber or hairdresser that allow you to present the best version of yourselves, the home service industry that comes to the rescue during emergencies, or our lawyers that assist us in navigating complicated legal landscapes. And as such, it's crucial that we support the small business community because at the core of it, they're just making all of our lives better. And that's what Grow with Google Digital Coaches seek to provide. They provide business owners with digital skills needed to succeed. And if you haven't heard about Grow with Google Digital Coaches, allow me to share a little bit about our program. Google Digital Coaches offer live training and hands-on coaching on topics like how to connect with customers, how to sell products online, and improve business productivity for free. Grow with Google Digital Coaches are local marketing experts and entrepreneurs, and there are currently 18 coaches across the countries. From small towns to metropolitan cities, we help small businesses grow. And all small businesses deserve to thrive. But this month, we would like to pay special attention to Black-owned businesses who, despite making up 14% of the population, only represent 3% of all businesses. Black-owned businesses and entrepreneurs continue to remain an important segment of the U.S. economy. And that's why we feel it's important to connect with ent entities such as the U.S. Black Chambers to assist Black-owned businesses in their growth and expose those who are curious about starting a business to what's possible for them. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, many Black-owned businesses have come back strong, currently at about 30% above pre-pandemic level, we know that e-commerce tools are particularly helping SMBs stay afloat during these times. And e-commerce sales have increased by 43% since the start of the pandemic. We also know that nearly 43% of cyber attacks are on small businesses. So today, like we do every day, our coaches are going to give small business owners what is needed to tackle what most matters to their success. We'll learn how to stay safe from cyber threats and grow with e-commerce and other key tools. Now, before we dive into our agenda for today, I have the pleasure of introducing someone who is in the front lines of Black-owned business recovery and growth, and that is none other than Ron Busby Jr., co-founder of Buy Black. Ron Busby leads, Ron Busby Jr. leads the products team efforts around new features and external partnerships. Welcome, Ron. Over to you. Hi, my name is Ron Busby and happy Black History Month to everyone here. Uh, and we're really excited about the celebration we have for you all today. I am one of the co-founders of iBlack. We are an organization that is connected to the United States Black Chambers. It has over 140 local Black Chambers of Commerce around the country that support over 260,000 Black-owned businesses. Uh, one of the really exciting things that we get to do is create meaningful economic opportunities for Black people through the Black businesses in their communities. And we know that building strategic tools and partnerships is a critical way to help Black enterprises grow and thrive. That is why I am so excited that this event is happening and that we get a chance to talk about the Black on Business Summit and where the USBC and Google are coming together to provide meaningful trainings and insights for Black on businesses like yourselves. But before we get into diving into trainings, I want to share a little bit about Buy Black and take you all through a little bit what work we do here. In terms of what Buy Black is and who we are, Buy Black is a social impact organization that is working with the United States Black Chambers. We are dedicated to addressing the issues that are historically barriers for Black-owned businesses. Uh, we really, as I said a little earlier before, see the value in creating economic opportunities for Black-owned businesses 
um, and Black people through those businesses. Uh, for us, we are really excited about being a national directory that has tons of resources for general Black-owned businesses, but also has a certification uh, that provides really great tooling and access for certified Black-owned businesses. And we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, the certification itself and the Buy Black ecosystem provides and opens doors for uh, exclusive contracting opportunities, training resources, and empowering entrepreneurs like yourself to connect to customers, uh, community, and capital. So why we do what we do, uh, the name by Black, it's not a misspelling. Uh, usually people think about B-U-Y when we're talking about Black, but for us, we really wanted to develop an idea of what does it mean for our tools, our resources, and our communities to be powered by Black people. Uh, so we are really interested in more than just consumption, but coalition building. The problem that we see out here in the world is that there really just aren't cohesive and comprehensive tools for purchasing from black owned businesses across diverse buying categories. So whether you're a corporation or you're a consumer or your local government, there just isn't an easy way for you to get the tools to prioritize finding black owned businesses. Um, so for well, at black and for the US black chambers, we thought it was really important to enhance the value proposition, connect the communities and in the past three years, the real question is, what have we accomplished since we started on this uh, sort of thing? We've had 33,000 Black-owned businesses, which is about one in every 100 Black-owned businesses today, join the directory. We have 14,000 applications for our certification. You have 2.5 million people that have come to buy Black to look for a great date spot or a great business they can do business with, um, or they're just looking to learn more about Black businesses in their community. Uh, the corporations that we've gotten a chance to partner with are vast and numbered, uh, but it's really great to have companies like Google that understand the value prop of doing this work and will really help we're helped by the fact that we have an ecosystem of black owned business of we have an ecosystem of corporations super dedicated to buying from and engaging with black owned businesses and this is just an example of that uh how do we democratize access for all black owned businesses w what does that mean and how do we do that is a great question that really motivates and animates us in our work for us we think the answer to that is that we have to build a platform for their consumers and for their customers. For our consumers, they need well-designed, simple, and easily navigable tools to find black and businesses. For corporations, their motivation is that they need certified businesses that they can engage with for their spending uh, obligations and for the commitments they've made to buying more diverse and growing their diverse supply chains. And for governments, they really see it as something that's driven by legislative demands. They have mandates to engage with diverse businesses and they have transparency responsibilities to ultimately show how they're not just taking tax dollars out of a community, but they're also investing in the businesses in those, in those communities. And so Buy Black is hopefully an answer to some of those questions in various different ways for different folks in that conversation. So when we talk about what does it mean to be a solution for B2B enterprises, you see a laundry list of companies that we work with, and we're really proud to see that we have a really diverse ecosystem of businesses, whether you're in the entertainment space, whether you're in the hospitality space, whether you're in uh, the tech or ecosystems around uh, you know, alcohol and beverage, it's a really diverse bag of businesses that recognize the value of buying black and want to do that. Uh, and so for us, when we talk about what it means to buy black, we recognize that it can be a really diverse set of buying needs that different companies have. And this is just a really great example of showing how B2B enterprises, enterprise companies are looking to ultimately buy and build a more diverse supply chain for themselves. The pandemic has really taught us that having one singular supplier that provides all your needs can actually create choke points and friction when you're looking to grow or manage uh, the responsibilities you have to your clients. And so for a lot of these companies, and Google being a great example of that, they've actually said, how do we actually go about building more Black businesses into our supply chain so that we know that diverse supply chains are resilient supply chains? Uh, and we're really proud to just be able to find that more companies understand or are growing the kind of literacy around diversity in their supply chains as a part of the way that they're working. For B2G, and so what does that really mean is business to government, it's really about saying, okay, for them, they have uh, mandates and they have transparency requirements around how they spend and who they spend with. The federal government spends $9 trillion a year, and they only spend about 1% of that with Black-owned businesses. They've recognized that that's both a problem, but also that that needs to ultimately grow. And the way they're going to do that is both by sharing the numbers, but also then finding black owned businesses that they can do business with that it could truly be a number of different things. So for the fact that we have one in 100 black owned businesses, the, the, the day that we're able to get to one in five and one in two, we remove excuses for 
business to business, business to government, to be able to buy more from the black owned businesses that they're in their communities. In terms of the solution for business to consumers, and we recognize that consumers are trying to prioritize buying from black owned businesses. And so they are really excited about the brands that bring them interesting products and services. And we really want to be able to connect them to that. And we see that as well from the searches that are coming uh, on our directory. Uh, we have a business owner out of DC who said that Buy Black is the platform they always felt like their community deserved, but never had. And we're really proud to be here and to continue to be of service to all kinds of black owned businesses. I want to just really emphasize what I said before, which is that it's not a fad. We see that research and a number of different examples show that so many different consumers, so many different communities are interested in buying black, whether it's the fact that over a quarter of black Americans and 40% of those who are under 35, specifically in the black community, are, are trying to buy from black businesses at least once a week. We know that consumers really see and only can often only find black owned businesses either through word of mouth, but also through trusted brands and trusted resources. For us, we take pride in being a trusted resource to be able to help black, black businesses be found. Uh, but we also really think it's valuable to ensure that consumers know that there are black businesses out there that are either nearby or can get to them, whether it's you can ship, you can deliver, or you provide virtual servicing. We think there's value in letting them know that you're there and that you're ready to ultimately engage with them. What we talked about was there's a directory and there's certification. And for certifications, it's really interesting to see that we have all kinds of businesses that are getting certified. And so we want to make sure that those black owned businesses also get access to the same opportunities as well. Uh, for us, we know that there are really great benefits for being certified that we can help champion uh, in that regard. The three kind of main elements that we talk a lot about are increased access to set aside for government contracting opportunities, the ability to subcontract on large projects that are required um, to source work from small businesses. Uh, and then the other kind of third is the eligibility for financial assistance programs uh, in the form of loans, grants, and other fiduciary elements. But I think we can also talk a little bit about inside of Buy Black specifically, what are the opportunities that we provide for our businesses? So here are a more holistic list of benefits around certification for Buy Black. And what's really cool is that we offer all these things, whether it's referral programs or contract matchmaking or educational resourcing, all this stuff is awesome, but it's also at no cost. So for us, we have really tried to make sure that we remove excuses. And we said that at the top of this is we want to remove excuses for people being buying, being able to buy black, whether that's for business owners getting certified because you don't have an excuse that there's no cost to the services that we offer, or it's for corporations, local governments, because the businesses are here and that we have a robust list of businesses that's growing and that want to do business and have the capacity to support the different demands and buying needs. The real question is, how do I get started? How do I get involved? How do I know that this is for me? There are really three elements. It's proof of ownership, proof of control, and proof of identity. You can see that each one of these buckets has different documents that you'll need to provide. Not every single one of these is going to be relevant for every type of business category. If you're an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp, you'll have different documents that will need to be able to prove that it's either owned by a black person or persons, that you actually know what your business is, all of the above. But this is just giving you a really holistic list. And I really recommend you check out the scan me sort of thing at the bottom or at the top in the corner. And, um, you know, we'll also have another example of where you can scan some more of those documents as well. Uh, so just in terms of what's new on Buy Black, we have so many great things that we're always working on. But one of the things we're really proud of is that we have a grants list that's available to our business owners and to people generally. So if you know somebody who wants to be able to access free money, we have um, a grants list that we keep and we maintain across the entire country of opportunities that are going on, whether they're looking for businesses that are in hair care or in scientific spaces, uh, whether it's in construction work, et cetera, in its specific states or specific counties. We're keeping track of so many grants that we want people to know about because oftentimes things just don't get applied to. And so for us, if you check out the link there, you can see all the kind of things that we're keeping uh, an eye on and you can access uh, for about 99 bucks. We will keep you in the loop on all the stuff that we know is going on. But I think what we're really proud of at the end of the day is that you can start your journey right now. If you're interested in joining by black, if you're interested in being a part of the work that we're doing, we talk a lot about how do we go from movement uh, to momentum? How do we take all of this work and keep it going, not just in black history month, but every day in between, you can check out the links here, check out and scan what we have available. And we're really excited to have you hopefully join us in the work that we're doing with Google um, and with great partners that really understand the value of my black. Thank you, Ron, and to the entire U.S. Black Chamber team for your partnership. So what's on the agenda today? We'll start with our 
Pennsylvania coach, Soleil Mead, who will teach you how to increase your sales with Google tools. We'll also have a presentation on how to protect your business from cyber attacks with our DMV coach, Sterling McKinley. Then we'll have a short break, but stay tuned because we have an amazing small business roundtable discussion with Talisha Bekovac, EVP of U.S. Black Chamber, who will moderate with business owners Terry Johnson, founder of the Harlem Candle Company, and Uchenna Ngudo, founder of CC's Closet. These are CC's Closet earrings, by the way. And I want to go over a few housekeeping notes and reminders. Make sure you share your social media experience using hashtag grow with Google, hashtag BHM, and tag us at Digital Coaches Program on Instagram. And don't forget, you can turn on YouTube's closed captioning by clicking on the closed captioning button directly on the video player on your screen. We also want you to engage in the chat Throughout the event, we want to hear from you. So feel free to drop an emoji in the chat, show some love to your speakers, and tell us your thoughts, your questions, and your comments. We will have our coaches in the chat who can respond to any comments. And if you have questions that you want answered during our live Q&A, make sure you post your questions in the chat as well. And with that, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to our digital coaches. First up, We'll have Sterling McKinley, our DMV coach, and Soleil Mead, our Pennsylvania coach. Hello, and welcome to today's workshop, Cybersecurity in Your Small Business. Now, this is so important. I like to say that cybersecurity should be the number one concern of every small business, but sadly, it's not but it should be the number one concern of your small business. So I want you to go to your little coffee shop. I want you to go in the store, unlock your phone, and I want you to give it to a random stranger, okay? <laughs> now don't do it, that's just a joke. But in a sense, that's how we're treating our data and security. We're literally not taking the steps needed and we're giving bad actors, we're giving spammers, hackers, access to our phones and information. And this is so important today. Why? Because every day, as you know, this world's becoming more and more digital. It's to the point, if you don't open a cell phone, if you don't have email, you can't exist. So you need to protect that data. And once again, as things become more and more digital, the chances for cyber attacks go up. That's why it's so important that your business practices cybersecurity for your small business and not only for your business, but also for your customers' data and information. So who am I? My name is Sterling McKinley. I'm the DMV Grow with Google Digital Coach. Also, I'm the founder of Diversify Digital. I'm a small business owner just like you. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter those in the chat box. I'll be sure to go through and answer the questions. Now, if you're ready to go, ready to get started, and once again, go on that chat box and type in, let's go. <laughs> okay, I see a few comments now. All right, let's go, let's get started. So. The next few slides, I'm going to give you an example of some of these spam messages that you may get on your, your phone and also on your computer. All right, so this is one of the common ones we get. Wow, you were gifted $1.5 million. All you have to do is reply to this email or download something, click this link. Don't do it. A rule of thumb, if something sounds too good to be true, then it's not true. So once again, be cautious whether it's 1.5 million dollars it can be 400 dollars. do not click on that email mark it as spam and go about your day now here's another common one and the thing now too spammers bad actors are getting creative so you'll get the messages also on your email on your desktop but also you get them on your cell phone so here's an example let's say you have a account on netflix or maybe you don't you get a text saying, hey, click this link to resubscribe, to update your password. That's probably fraudulent. So once again, you have to be vigilant. Every email, every text you get, you have to scrutinize that because what spammers and hackers are planning on, hoping on, is that you're busy, you're not paying attention, and you click that. Personal story, I get these all the time, sometimes from bank accounts or from services I don't even own. But once again, they're hoping that you click on one of these links and your computer's open up to, to virus or different malware. So once again, don't respond to these messages from um, various people. 
make sure that it's correct. If you haven't asked to reset your password and you get a password, don't click it. Here's another common email you may get. This person is demanding Bitcoin ransom. So to send an email once again, they're offering, um, if you don't send me 500 Bitcoin, we'll delete, uh, release pictures or videos of you. So once again, they want to get you, get you scared and have you send them money. Once again, if somebody is demanding money, any form, any currency, make sure that you also mark the email as spam and not reply to it. And here's another one you might see. So this person now is leaning on your, your good nature. They're giving some advice, something like, uh, think about what happens if your information is um, leaked. Make sure you change all your passwords. Once again, if you get this email to somebody, they're trying to come across as nice as friendly. But once again, this could be somebody that's trying to steal your information. So once again, mark this email as spam and do not reply to it. All right, so today we're talking about a few things. First, we're gonna talk about why cybersecurity matters for your business. I said it earlier, this world is so digital now and you have to protect your data, your life, your money, and your business. Also, we're gonna talk about how to protect your business online. We're gonna, do, we're gonna talk about also what to do if you're attacked. And last, we'll wrap it up with some recaps and resources to help you do better and increase cybersecurity for your business. All right, cybersecurity matters for every business. I don't care how small you are. If you're at your kitchen table, it is you and your mom. <laughs> I don't care if you have 100 employees. Cybersecurity matters for every business. Once again, cyber criminals, they don't care how big or small you are. They are preying for every, on everybody. And most importantly, a small company probably doesn't have the measures in place to uh, prevent a cyber attack. So you even more of a target to those cyber criminals. But once again, it's so important to take your business data and also your customer's data. Your customers giving you the credit card numbers, you have their bank account numbers, their password, all that stuff matters. The last thing you wanna get is hacked and lose your business information and also have your customer's information exposed. All right, got to stay here. It says 65% of business leaders say Data security and customer privacy are the top concern. 65%. All right. Personally, I think that's kind of low. So I think this should be 100%. But this shows us that there's not a lot of people that think it's a concern. Cyber criminals, they know this and they're going after that. So make sure that cybersecurity is a major priority for your business. If it's not, let today be the day. Let Black History be the month of time that you take cybersecurity serious for your business. Also, 85% of small business leaders say that having a cybersecurity plan in place will make them more comfortable using digital tools and also make them feel more safe in the business over the next two years. Once again, so this shows us having a plan is going to increase that feeling of security. So make sure you really tune in to this workshop. I'm going to give you tips and strategies to boost those positive feelings that make sure that you are confident in ways that you can use cybersecurity to protect your business and your client's information. So moving on to how to protect yourself online. This is very important. And one thing I want to say is that you have to think about in your head, don't break it up into small business and personal. Like anybody on your phone, you have your business email, you have your personal email. It's really all commingled together. So you have to protect everything just not one thing. Think about that. So what you do on your phone matters because at the end of your phone, they're going to get into your business information and the same goes with your laptop. So once again, you have to scrutinize every email, every text, whether that's on your cell phone, your personal device, or also on your work computer. All right. So think of cybersecurity as house in a sense. Cyber criminals want to find any way to get into the house. All right, so I'll give you a story here. <laughs> so growing up, I was a latchkey kid, pr pretty common. And about once a month, I would forget my key, right? This is just my thing. And guess what? I'm not sitting outside till my parents get home at five, six o'clock. No, I'm trying to get in the house because I'm hungry. <laughs> okay, so guess what? I checked the kitchen windows. I checked the bedroom windows. I checked the back door. I even checked the little small kitchen window, um, small uh, window above the uh, the shower to get in. <laughs> Any way possible, I was going to find a way in the house. 
other than breaking a window or door. Not that much, but if I can get in, I was going to get in. But guess what? It's the same thing for your business. Cyber criminals are not going to stop. They're going to find whatever vulnerability they can and attack that. So that can be an ID website, that can be ID software, or it can be technical vulnerability. So do this. In the shout box, I want you to type protect this house. <laughs> Hashtag protect this house. Once again, you have to protect your cyber house. Because in your house, there's your private possession, there's your kids, there's photographs, it's your safety. Protect your house. Do not let cyber criminals get into your house. Make sure that you're taking every step to make sure your house, your cyber house is secure. Now, moving on to one of the most common things you can do. This is the first line of defense protecting your password and your identity. This is very, very, very important. This is the first line of defense you can do. So here's some ways. The first one, this is whew, the easiest one, create strong passwords, okay? I read a study a while ago, I think one, two, three, four, five password was one of the most used passwords. Don't do that, please. Make sure your password is hard to guess. Make sure your password is not common. Um, also your password, keep them private. Don't share your password with anybody, not, 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 your, not your mother, not your father, not your brother. <laughs> the only person to know my password is my wife because if something happens, she needs to get into my accounts. But be careful about who you share your password with. Also, make sure that you use a different password for each account. I'll say it again. Make sure you use a different password for each account. <laughs> this is so important because you want to make sure as somebody gets into one account, they can't get into other accounts and take over everything. Now, this is very hard. You know, you all got that password that you love, you remember, you use it again and again, but be careful. Don't use the same password or the same password with variations on the same accounts. Why? Because that's why if somebody gets into your, say your Gmail, now they can get into other things, social media, they can get into your alarm systems for your outs. So make sure you create strong passwords. So you're probably saying Sterling, I have hundreds of passwords. How can I create passwords that are difficult to guess and that are unique for each account? I have the same problem. I have over 400 logins, 400, which is crazy. There's no way that you can remember hundreds or even dozens of passwords. Well, you're in luck. There's something called a password manager. Password managers help you use strong, unique passwords for all your online accounts. One that I use is Google Password Manager. It helps you create, save, and auto put passwords. So when you go to your banking account, it automatically recognizes the, the URL from that account and it fills in your username and password. This is awesome. And it also can work on your mobile device, your cell phone, tablet, anywhere as you're logged into your Google applications. Once again, this is a great way to secure all your passwords in one place and not be running around, you know, trying to remember all these passwords. To find out more about Google Password Manager, visit passwords.google.com. All right, next, moving on to two-step verification. So once again, in the chat box, type in two-step, <laughs> two-step. This is very important. This is something too that you can do. So what this does, it helps protect your account uh, with something known like a password or like a physical device, like a cell phone. So I'll give you an example. I go to my Gmail account. I put in my username and my password. And then what it does is it sends a password or a code to my mobile device. I then say, okay, this is me. I click yes. I put in the password and now I can be signed into my account. So what this does is creating multiple points of failure. So maybe somebody does have your password, but guess what? That's not good enough. The other thing they need is something like your cell phone or like a security key to get into your account. Um, Two-step verification is, is great. Um, not only on Google products and services, pretty much everything out there that's digital now has two-step verification. But what is it going to do? It's going to make it harder for somebody to get into your account. So once again, um, forbid somebody has your password. Now with two-step verification, they can't get into your account without you knowing. Also remember, Google Workspaces and Google Accounts offer two-step verification. Once again, this is one of the single most important things you can do to make sure you protect your business. To find out more, visit google.com backslash workspace. So here's some more tips for Google Workspace security. 
First, limit who can see newly created files. One users when they have shared a file that with people outside your company. Also, be sure to restrict your calendar sharing with people outside your company. Also, remember admins should add recovery information to their account. To see more, simply visit g.co backslash scroll backslash workplace security. Do not leave your computers unattended. This is so, so important. So let's say you're at your local coffee shop. You sat down, you're on your laptop, and they call your number, call your name. You leave your laptop, you leave your, your cell phone, and you go get your, your latte, which is great. But guess what? That moment you turn your back, somebody could come to your computer, your laptop, and they could take it, and it could be gone. Or they could log in. They could send an email. They could get a password. So don't leave your computer or your mobile device unattended. Don't let it out of the eyesight. Also, be sure to lock your screen. So on my phone, after um, 60 seconds, one minute, the screen locks. Uh, my desktop, same thing. After five minutes, the screen locks. Once again, making sure that if you happen to have your device stolen or you lose it, uh, somebody can get in without knowing your password or your lock device, your lock um, password again. Also, what you can do is make sure that you only enable the services or apps people need to do their jobs. So an example, if your graphic designer, they do not need to log in um, to your payroll system or software. So once again, it sounds simple, but just don't give blanket access to anybody for your business. And also too, if you use contractors, if you have somebody that's working for you on a project, don't give them the keys to the game. No, only give them what they need. And this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing. I work with so many customers and clients, right? I worked for them for a month, a few years, and I leave. And I still go in and I see on social media, other sites, they haven't deleted my login yet. Some companies, I can even see my email. So make sure that one employee or contractor leaves, you cut off access to your account. You change the password, you log in, you deactivate the account so they can't get back into the account. Also, do not trust unknown USBs. Once again, if you see a USB drive laying around, you put it in your computer, don't do that. Once again, that drive may uh, install some virus software and let somebody get into your computer. So once again, um, keeping your computer safe is key. And then that's the thing about Cybersecurity. A lot of it is what you do. What steps are you taking to protect yourself? And but it's about mitigating the risk. It's making about making it harder for somebody to have the information. So once again, do your part, do what you can to protect your information. All right, next, keeping your device safe is very key. Once again, make sure all the devices you have are encrypted. Uh, encryption means that the data on that is uh, kind of like scrambled, it's hard to decipher and that somebody can't, um, can't get access to it or make sense of it. So have, make sure that all your devices are encrypted. So if they're sending things over Wi-Fi, make sure they're encrypted. Next thing is to require a pin to unlock all devices. So once again, I have a pin uh, belonging to my device. Um, here's the big one. Allow mobile data wiping. This is key. So true story here. So um, I dropped my um, cell phone in the bathtub. <laughs> a few weeks ago. Um, my fault, I should not have been working in, in, uh, in the bathroom, <laughs> but I took my phone in there and I dropped it in the bathtub and water got in uh, to my phone and the screen went black in a few minutes. Uh, but guess what? I didn't panic. Why? Because um, I ha have a phone uh, that's uh, signed in to, to Google. So all of my uh, passwords, all of my pictures were in Google Drive were all set up. So all I had to do is go online um, to Google. I had to wipe my device. And then once I got a new device, all I had to do was sign in with my Google username and password. And all the information that was on my phone is now wiped from the old phone and now available on my new phone. So data wiping is key. Also, you wanna be sure to back up your data. So if you're like me, if you lose your cell phone, it gets damaged, get stolen you have a backup of all that data that is very key so once again make sure you keep your mobile device safe so let's check in i've been talking a lot so if you're enjoying this uh workshop if you're finding what i'm uh, telling you uh valuable uh rate me rate, rate me so if this is the best 
uh, workshop you ever been to, give, give me a five. <laughs> if this is so so. If I need to do better, give me give me a one. All right. So I see a few fives in the chat box. Appreciate that. So thank you. I'll keep keep going. All right. So some extra tips. So once again, keep your software up to date. This is very key. So when you log into your computer or your cell phone and it says there's a security update, don't hit delay. Don't put it off for months or weeks. Install that update. Why that update to your software is patching holes in the software. It will make it run better and faster, fix bugs, but also the security patches. So we'll make sure that security vulnerabilities that could be exploited by uh, hackers or bad actors are now patched. So as soon as you get those security updates, make sure you update them. Also, you want to avoid software that doesn't offer security options. So a lot of times on a computer, if you try to install software that's unsecure, it'll give you a warning. So once again, if, if software doesn't have security options, don't install it. Because the last thing you want to do is install you know, a program that's going to link information or not be safe. Next thing you want to do is establish policies limiting data stored on company and personal devices. This is huge. So some companies, um, you can only access your email on a desktop not personal advice. You can't do that. So think about your employees. Do you want to give them their own laptops? Do you want to give them their own um, phones? Because that way you can protect your data better. Because once again, you have to think about this. That's why I say protect your business data and your personal data. Because a lot of times we're accessing those um, software, those apps, whatever, on the same device. So make sure that you have positive in place for living data stored on company and also on personal devices. Also remember that Google Workspaces is secure by design. Google Workspace apps run in the cloud. Your business can benefit from the protection we built in using everyday tools. Once again, so if you're using uh, Gmail, if you're using Drive, if you're using Docs or Sheets, all the information is safe and protected. To find out more, visit workspaces.google.com backslash security. All right, this is the big one here. This is the big one. Protecting your customers is so key. Your customers are trusting you not only to do good by them business-wise, but also protect their data. So when they swipe the credit card, when they write you a check, when they give you your name or a password, you have to protect the information because the last thing you want is for a customer to get hacked because of you. Trust me, that won't go over a good for your customer. You might even lose customers. So once again, protecting your customers and key. And I think going forward in the future, companies also really have to make sure that they're protecting customer data. Your customers are going to ask you, if I give you my credit card information, if I swipe here, my password, are you protecting my data? If you're not, they're going to leave. So start now implementing policies for you protecting your customers' data. And not only that, but tell them that you're protecting their data. Once again, this is the marketing thing, I'm a marketing guy, but it's all about trust. So protect your customer's data and then tell them you're protecting your data and then trust is gonna go up. And one thing you also wanna do is secure your website. So there's something called HTTPS. You might've seen this before, but it stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. So if you ever go to a website and look in the address bar, you'll see that and you'll see a lock icon. That means that the information being transmitted from a computer to another computer, it's safe and secure and encrypted. This is something that's very important. So whether you're selling online or you're not selling, make sure that your site is secure and you are encrypting that data and information. So one way to do that is by using Google Sites. Google Sites by default include this protection. So things like Google Website Builder, Google Sites, they automatically come with HTTP access. Now, users can also share permission and ownership like they would a doc. So it's pretty cool. So once again, make sure you're using a service that already has security built in. Now, to find more about this service, simply visit google.com backslash sites. All right. Now, the next big thing is protecting your email. This is something I really want to key on. So the most common way that a hacker or spammer, a bad actor is gonna find access to your information is through email. This email hosts you for big companies. 
uh, somebody at, at a big company, I don't know which one, they click on the email, they click on a link, download a file, and now that file or that attachment has to install a piece of malware on a computer that lets a hacker into the system. And now the whole company is in trouble. So once again, you are the first line of defense. I cannot stress that enough. So be careful about your email. So once again, make sure that your emails are encrypted. Once again, you want to use transfer layer security, also known as TSL, and also you want to enable two-set verification. Once again, all these things are not 100%, but once again, they will lower the risk of your G of your email, I'm sorry, getting hacked. All right, so this is the, the, the big one, the big one here. Once again, don't open any suspicious email. Now, before we go through this, I give you give you a story. This is kind of embarrassing. Don't, don't judge me. Um, but I like to think of myself as a very person that's very aware, especially of security, but even I have fallen victim twice <laughs> to, uh, to, to hackers and email. So first one, I'll give you a um, few weeks back. I got an email from an old client. Um, he was saying, oh, Sterling, there's a new RFP to download an RFP and click on this hyperlink and it'll take you to the RFP. I clicked on that hyperlink and it took me to a website that I didn't recognize. So as soon as I did that, I knew that that email was from a hacker. So first thing I did, I um, marked the email as, as spam. Um, I closed it out. I then called my client and asked him, did you send me an email? He said, no, I've been hacked. I've been trying to tell people not to open emails from me, but you've been hacked. Um, now, the first thing that I did uh, was a lot of steps. I installed via software and so on. But once again, the email, it looked real. It did, it was from his email, his signature line, his uh, profile picture, everything was right. And it was still, it was wrong. So once again, that also goes back to your customers. A hacker could get a hold of your email and email your customers, and then they could send information to the hacker. So think about that. Every email has to be scrutinized, even if you recognize the sender. Look at the email. You want to see if it makes sense or not. Uh, next thing is do not click on unsolicited emails. Once again, that's what I did. I got a random email. I clicked on it and sent me to another website. But once again, I didn't ask for the email. The client didn't reach out to me and tell me it was coming. So once again, you want to scrutinize every message. Also, look out for suspicious email addresses and email signatures. Once again, there's some things you can, you can look at. Look at the email signature. Look at the email address. Make sure it's coming from the right person. These are all ways that you can make sure um, that the email you're opening is not um, not bad and not going to lick your information. Okay, so the next thing you want to do is beware of phishing scams. This is very common. So phishing, what's phishing mean? Phishing means where a hacker or spammer, they are sending you a message that looks like a real brand. So a brand like, like Ace, a brand like you know, your bank or whoever, that looks real. They'll have the logo, the color scheme, everything. It looks real. But guess what? This is not a real email from this company. It's not. They're faking it. And they're hoping by faking it that you click on the link, you reset your password, and now they have access to your system. So once again, even spam with the hackers are hoping on that they know you're busy, you're moving fast. When I clicked on that link from my client, guess what? I dropped my son off. I was driving to get lunch at a stoplight. I opened up my email and I saw it, clicked on the link. But they're hoping that you act out of panic, that you're busy and that you don't scrutinize things. So when it comes to that, make sure you're taking that time and making sure that that email is coming from a real person. Once again, because bad actors, Scammers, hackers are hoping on you being busy and you're acting out of impulse and not checking that email or that message. How to spot spam. This is very important. Once again, you're the first line of defense. So one thing, uh, the subject line, if there's a threat um, of unplanned expense, like, oh, you have a million dollars due or urgency, they want you to work fast. That should, once again, send up alarms in your head. Once again, they're trying to scare you they're trying to say this has to be done now next thing look at the sender is the sender unknown that's not right the sender should have a name there 
Also, if you see no profile picture, it's very key. So the picture in that profile should match the picture of the person that you know. Next, you have to make sure that the email is not poorly written. Now, scammers and hackers, all these people, normally they're not the best emails. They send them out to everybody. They have grammatical errors in it. They seem very bullet plate. So read the email. If it doesn't make sense, don't reply. Also, do not click on any links or attachments you don't recognize because that, once again, could be a way to expose your system to unknown threats and hackers. The next thing is, can you spot which one is fake? Now, these two screenshots of a Google login, I want you to look at them and then we'll say which one is fake, which one is real. So take a minute, pause, look at these two screenshots and tell me which one is fake, which one is real. Okay. Okay. So this one is not right. So if you look at the URL, the URL is funny. It's uh, google.com backslash https.com. That makes no sense. That's fake. Also, look at the sender. There's no sender and there's no profile picture. So once again, this login is fake. But once again, at first glance, it looks real. That's why you have to slow down and make sure you scrutinize everything you do online on your phone because you could be clicking on something that's from a, a spammer or a phishing attack. So I like to say that uh, Gmail is the Dikembe Mutombo <laughs> of spam phishing mail. <laughs> so Gmail blocks more than 99.9% .9 of spam, phishing attempts, and malware trying to reach you. Google spam filter blocks nearly 10 million spam emails every minute. That's amazing. So once again, if you're using Gmail, you're in the right place. Why? Because they take cybersecurity paramount and they're going to make sure that your data is not compromised. To find out more, visit google.com backslash Gmail. So the bottom line is think before you, you click. Think before you click. This little finger right here, whether it's on your mouse or touching your, um, your uh, cell phone screen. It is so powerful. Think before you click. Once again, if the offer is so enticing, it's unbelievable. It's probably not true. Um, once again, look at that uh, sender. Look at that profile picture. Um, don't click on any links. Don't download any attachments. You have to think before you click. Once again, spammers, the hackers, the bad actors are planning on, they're banking on you not thinking. And that's out of instinct, clicking on email, opening it but take that time to think before you open something on your phone or on your computer. All right, this is the big one. So plan ahead. And I always say this, so you don't want to, you have health insurance. Hopefully you never need it. You have homeowner insurance, you have car insurance, hopefully you never need it. But you're planning ahead in advance in case something does happen. You have to do the same for your business when it comes to cybersecurity. So once again, I'll say this again, the guy on the truth, the chance of you being hacked on some form, some level are pretty high. So why not take this time, Black History Month, this is the time to make a plan of how you're gonna respond if that happens. That's very key. I always say, you don't wanna be on Google, Googling how to respond to a cyber attack when you've been hacked. <laughs> no, you're hit, you're hit now. So, so, so zoom in, tap in, I'm gonna give you the tips on things you can do to plan ahead. So when you are attacked, you're not scrambling. And it's like when, you, when you're hacked, time is money. You have to have an immediate plan of attack because if you don't, that gets the hacker more time to get into your system and to send emails and cause havoc. So you have to have a plan and you have to respond promptly. So the first thing you do is have a plan ready. Now is the time. So once again, if you're a Gmail user, Hope you are. Uh, open up um, sheets and outline who is in charge of what and what needs to be done. Next thing is you want to take quick action. Once again, you want to be don't go hide. It's not going to go away. If you suspect that you've been hacked, that you click on the, on the email that's uh, fraudulent, don't wait. You have to act quickly. Next thing is you want to create a record of take assets. Once again, you can do this by using Google. Um, Google Sheets, open it up, put a column, platforms. Make a list of all the platforms and tools and software you're using. Next, 
check and see if all of those systems are up to date. Is your cell phone up to date? Is your website up to date? Is your computer up to date? Also, you wanna make a list of what accounts do you have and also what hardware you have. So cell phones, tablets, make all of that. If, if you're like me, I have a drawer full of old cell phones that don't work anymore. But those cell phones, they should be wiped. They should be destroyed. Make a list of all your tech assets. And this goes across cybersecurity, even the marketing. You have to do a audit. You have to know where you stand because if you don't, you're just scrambling. So make a list of all your tech assets, who's in control of those, and make sure that all those assets are updated and secure. The next thing is you want to have a clear policy and provide training. So once again, I don't care if you're a one person team, I don't care if you have a hundred people team, you can create an internal website um, only for your company where people can log in and constantly get tips on cybersecurity, things to look out for. Also, you want to find one person in your company that's a designated mailbox specialist or a security specialist. So if you get a frozen email, you can tell that person, you can flag it and send it to them. Let that person deal with it. Don't let it be your problems. So once again, provide clear training and policies on how to handle cyber attacks. Next thing is you want to create a security culture. And what I mean by that, you should always be talking about cybersecurity at home and at work. Always talk about it because, you know, it happens. The things we talk about more are the things we take seriously. You can go online, reading a new website, like the paper every day, some companies being being hacked, using their data information. So we have enough stories out here already. You should be talking about that story. So what did they do? What did they click on? How did that happen? Also, you want to encourage people to share their concerns. Once again, cyber criminals are banking on you being quiet or you're not telling anybody, hiding in a corner. No, but you should openly talk about your concerns. Say, hey, I got an email that didn't, didn't look right. Talk about that. Once again, this happens. We have to talk about things openly. Also, you want to ensure that you as the business owner, you as the leader are a good role model when it comes to security behaviors. It really starts at the top. So as you're the leader, you're the boss, even your one person show, make sure that you are leading by example that you are changing your passwords, that you're using a password manager, that you're using two-step verification, all of those things, because guess what? If you're doing it, it'll trickle down. And even in your home personal life, in your home, talk about cybersecurity, because once again, it's affecting everybody. Make sure the password to your uh, to your Wi-Fi is hard to guess. Um, if you change it, make sure the password to your bank information online is it, correct because all these things matter so create a culture just not your business but also in your life as a whole where you're talking where you're always on the lookout to trying to plug those cybersecurity holes now moving on to what to do if you're attacked once again you're probably going to get attacked i don't want you to hop on google and type in what to do if i got attacked <laughs> this is the time to formulate the plan of how you're going to react when you get hacked so First thing you want to do is you want to protect, once again, protect this house, put it in chat box and the chat on uh, chat box, protect this house. The first thing you want to do is protect your assets. So contact your bank, credit card companies and other financial institutions. Let them know that you've been hacked. They might close your account they might see your new card. They might do something else. They might tell you to reset your password, but let all of those financial institutions know that you've been hacked. Next thing you do is check your credit report for any loans or accounts you don't recognize. True story, happened to me before, but um, now I have my credit report on, on free, on a lock. So if anybody gets my social security number, they can't buy anything, they can't open a line of credit because I have that thing closed. Um, funny story, uh, my, my wife and I bought a house last year and um, the, the mortgage company was going to run my credit and, you know, they sent me an email say, Hey, things are held up. We couldn't pull your credit. So once again, the only time I turn my credit freeze off is when I'm applying for credit or a loan. Other than that, it's secure. So even if you do get my social security number, guess what? You still can't access my credit report. The next thing you want to do is dispute any charges or any accounts. And I'll say this too. It doesn't matter what the amount is. If it's one penny, if it's $1, if it's $100, 200, 
you have to report that because that could be the start of something bigger. So anytime you see a fraudulent charge in your account or accounts you don't have, make sure that you're reporting and you're disputing those charges because they're not real and they want you. Next, you can also file your report with the FBI's Internet Crime Compliance Center, also known as IC3. IC3 is a central hub for reporting cyber criminals. To find out more, visit www.ic3.gov. Now, why this is important too, because you need to make known to authorities what happened. So this same scam or hack doesn't happen to other people. So hopefully they can track this down by filing a case or other cases and stop that person and even maybe recover your, your property or your money as well. So be sure to contact the authorities and let them know what happened to you. Next step, once again, change all your passwords. So if you own the workshop now, okay? <laughs> the moment this workshop ends, change your passwords, please. I would say every few months, you should change your passwords. Every three, six months, change your password, your Gmail password, your bank password. Change those things up. Also, what you want to do is seek professional technical support right away. If you think your equipment was compromised by malware, ransomware. Why? Because these programs are hard to discover. You won't see a, um, a screen on your, on, your, on your monitor saying you've been hacked. This could be some um, program that's embedded deep in your computer that's hard to see. So a trained specialist can run through, through the monitoring and they can find that wear and hopefully take it off your computer. Also, if you have been hacked, continue to monitor your cover report and also your financial accounts. All right, moving on to recap and resources. So here's some things you can do to make sure that your business is safe and also your customer data is safe. So recap, first thing we said is use a strong password. And consider using a password manager like Google Password Manager. Once again, there's no way you can remember all the passwords to your account. You have to use a password manager to create complex, um, hard to guess passwords. So use a password manager. The next thing you can do is use two-step verification wherever possible. Once again, you log on to a website on your computer and it'll send a code to your phone. What that does, once again, two steps of failure. You may have my password, but you don't have my phone. It makes it harder that way to be hacked. Next thing you have to do is keep equipment safe, including mobile phones. Once again, when you're out at a coffee shop, don't leave your computer. Don't leave your phone unattended. Also, make sure that you have a lock screen for your devices. Also, make sure you use secure websites that have HTTPS. Once again, Google Sites have this, but any website that you have, make sure that the site's secure no matter what platform you're on. Next, you want to be sure to use the email provider that supports encryption, like Gmail. <laughs> so make sure your email is secure. The next thing is make a plan. Create a list of tech assets. This is so key. Once again, go into Drive, open up Google Sheets, and make a list of all your tech assets you have. There may be some you forgot about. And make sure the devices are destroyed. Make sure they're, they're safe with a good password. And also wipe any old information from them. And the last one is the most important is develop and nurture a security culture. This is so key. Once again, this is something you should constantly be talking about, constantly being reinforced. You have to be ready. Why? Because guess what? The cyber criminals, the hackers, they are. They're up in their game. They're getting smarter. They're getting better as they goes on. So you, as a small business owner, have to make sure that you are developing a culture, a lifestyle, even after your job, to where you're always being vigilant about cyber attacks and information being linked about your company or your personal life. So for more tips, from Google, you can visit Google's Safety Center for tools and tips on how to help you stay safe online. Also, there's a security checkout that provides recommendations to help strengthen the security of your Google accounts. Once again, to find out more about this, visit safety.google. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the summit. Goodbye. Hello everyone and welcome to today's workshop, Increase Your Sales with Google Tools. My name is Soleil Mead and I am proudly the Grow With Google digital coach for Pennsylvania. 
I'm also the founder and owner of Soleil Branding Essentials, a full service branding agency helping nonprofits and small businesses establish, enhance, and evolve their brands. As we celebrate Black History Month and our ancestors, it really feels amazing to know that I am on this live with so many history makers. We truly have become our ancestors' wildest dream. So I want to know, how are you making Black history? How are you Black history in the making? Drop it in the chat. Tell us about your business. Tell us about what you do to make you Black history. So let's jump into the agenda for today. We are going to explore two important tools that can help you increase your sales. The first is going to be your Google business profile, where you can share information about your business and help people discover what you offer in an easy way. We also are going to talk about Google Merchant Center, where you can list your products on Google, even if you don't have a website. Our ultimate goal is going to set you up for success online, and then we'll do a recap of everything that we talked about today. So let's go ahead and get started. So before we go any further, I want to ask you this important question about your business. Who are you? So the reality is, it doesn't matter if you're a brick and mortar or an e-commerce business, or you could be an omni-channel business where you sell both in store and online. What you will learn today is going to help you turn those curious shoppers into paying customers for your business. So let's do a quick activity. I want y'all to go to the chat and tell me three things about your business, three things that you want your potential customers to know about your business. It could be, you know, that you have in stock or in store inventory. It could be the amazing services that you provide. What are three things that if someone comes in contact with your brand that you want them to know? I want you to list at least three of those things in the chat. So I want you to keep these three things in mind. Keep your customers in mind as we move forward. We are going to next take a look at how you can Share these things that you want your customers to know at no cost through some Google tools. So let's start with a Google business profile. Did you know that more than two thirds of U.S. consumers say that it is important to support local businesses? That means that two thirds of U.S. consumers believe that it is important to support you. There are people in your local communities that want to support your business and you can help them do that by having a Google business profile. So today I want to introduce a business that we'll be following throughout this presentation. It is Woodworth Throwbacks in Hamtramck, Michigan. The owners are Bo Shepard and Cal Doobie. They got started furnishing their own apartments with like roadside cast offs that they would found littered around the streets. So when they would look for material around their city, they would gather like wood, metal, different signage, and then they would transform these items into home goods for their own homes, turned into a salvage creation business that focused on sustainability. So what started as a one car garage operation grew into a full grown business with 24,000 square foot facility. How did they do this? What tools did they use? In addition to their talent, they use tools like the Google business profile to help them get there. So let's look at what this looks like for Woodward Throwbacks. So here you can see Woodward Throwbacks business profile shown on a mobile device. It includes photos from their store. It talks about some of the products they have and even gives some contact information about their business. If you have ever searched for a specific business, whether it's on your phone or on your desktop, you've seen these business profiles before. So I love to call our Google business profile your digital storefront. It gives that key information that people need to know about your business in order to decide if they want to take that next step. It can highlight your holiday hours. It can share updates and product offers, different events that you may be having. People can read reviews about your business and so much more. And we are going to get into all of those features today. So one of the things that you want to make sure 
of is whenever you have your business profile, you are going to be found by people in your local area. And it's important to know that once you create a business profile, you also are going to be able to be found on Google Maps. So if a person is in the Detroit area and they're looking for a unique housewarming gift for a family member, then they may end up running into Woodward throwbacks on their list. More than two thirds of U.S. shoppers believe that it's important to support local businesses. I said it once and I'll say it again. People are looking for you. So we want to make sure that your business is showing up by having a Google business profile so people can find you. One of the things that Bo said, and Bo is one of the owners of Woodward Throwbacks, they said that they have been amazed by the number of visits their site gets just through their business profile. So people are finding your business, they found their business, and they can find your business as long as you're set up. So let's talk about what it takes to create your business profile. Business profiles are available for businesses with physical locations that are open to customers, as well as businesses that provide services in a local area. So here we have the four steps it takes to essentially get your profile set up. So the first thing you want to do is visit google.com backslash business. Once you do that, you will want to claim, meaning you'll type in your business name and you want to make sure you type in your business name as it's familiar on the World Wide Web. That's how you want to type it in. If it comes up, you claim it. If it doesn't come up, you complete the information to get your profile set up. It'll add some important information about your business name, so on and so forth. You'll have all that information because it's information that you use on a regular basis regarding your business. Once you've completed that information, then the next step will be to verify that information. And that can happen through a postcard or some of the other verification methods that we have. So it is no surprise that people are often looking for deals and discounts. 70% of shoppers in a survey said that deals and discounts and special promotions make a difference when they choose where to shop. So if we know that great information, then what we want to do is make sure that we post our deals and our discounts and our offers and not just on our website, but also on our business profile. So the next feature we're going to talk about is post. So the same way that you would post on social media is the same way that you can post in your business profile. So in this slide, you see two posts here from Woodward Throwbacks. One is about updated showroom hours, and then they have a free shipping post. You know, some of us love free shipping. So whenever you are ready to do that, you are going to, again, go into your business profile and click on the add update icon. Once you click on that, then it's going to ask you what type of post do you want to create? Do you want to create an update, an offer, or an event? So you would go and select whichever one fits your business and what you're working on at the moment and then complete all of the information. This is so important because remember, Google is the number one search engine in the world. So any information you put on your business profile is going to show up in a potential Google search. So the more information you put on your business profile, the more posts, the updates, offers, and events, then that increases your likelihood to be seen and hopefully create a customer from the information that you're posting. So another important, very, very important feature to pay attention to in your business profile is customer reviews. Listen, I look at reviews for everything. I want to know what people are saying before I decide to go with that business. So the same shopping habits that we have, a lot of times our potential customers are having those same epiphanies as well. 64% of U.S. holiday shoppers using Google said that they did so for discovery and inspiration. And customer reviews can be very important in influencing that purchase decision. 
So we want to make sure that we have good reviews. We want to make sure that we respond to any and all reviews. And now we're going to look into what that looks like in the business profile. So whenever you are trying to connect with your customers through reviews, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. You can do that through the read reviews icon where it'll show you all of the reviews that you have received in. You can also do that by enabling the messaging feature. And there's also a public Q&A section. Whenever you get a review, sometimes if it's not a good review, it can feel tricky. You know, if you're angry about a review, wait till you calm down to respond, but don't wait several weeks to respond as soon as you possibly can to show that your business has that integrity to respond to any feedback in a timely manner. If they contact you and the issue is resolved, one of the things that you can do is ask them to modify or remove the negative review. So that's some some tips that you can use whenever you are responding to reviews, whether they're good or whether they're negative. If they're good, make sure you let them know that you're, you're listening to them. Thank them for their feedback. Ask them if they would like to give any additional feedback or see something different from your business. But remember, short and sweet and stay professional stay kind and keep your business and your brand integrity in mind when you are addressing reviews. This is the important one as well. So a lot of us will see those reviews pop up on our business profile, but how do we ask people to give us reviews? Well, Google Business Profile makes that so easy for you. So you can go ahead and click on the icon that says ask for reviews, and then you will see what you see on the screen here. So it's an image that will show you the link that you can copy it to send it out to people. It also has buttons where you can select email and it will send it to email as you put that person's email address in. If you wanna send it on WhatsApp, it'll integrate with your WhatsApp app, maybe on your phone or on your computer, and you can send it that way. If you click the Facebook button, then it will pull up your Facebook account and there's a generated text for it and everything asking people to leave reviews. This button for your reviews is gold. You can put that on your website, you can post it in your newsletter or the marketing materials that go out, but you wanna make sure that you ask for reviews. I'm challenging you right now to grab your review link and post it on your most popular social media stream or in any business marketing that you have going out this month. And then I need you to make sure at the end of the month, you check back on your business profile and see how many new reviews that you can get. Simply asking for it can be the very thing that puts that power behind your business and allows you to hear the impact that you're having and allow that impact to ripple out to the other people that are interested in your brand. So let me know, put an explanation point in the chat if you are going to take this challenge and ask for reviews, literally a task that you can get done in less than probably five minutes, that can mean the world to your business. Your next biggest client may be on the other side of reading a review that one of your current clients or customer makes. So let's make that move together. All right, so let's talk about how products can appear. One of the things that the business profile does is it encourages our customers to learn more about your products, meaning that if they see your profile already, they've shown some level of interest based off of how they've searched in Google. So when they come to your profile, having images and information about the products that you provide can draw them even closer to becoming an actual customer and sealing that deal with your business. So the wonderful thing is that even if you don't have a website up yet, you can still use your business pro uh, profile to give shoppers that, that feel for what you offer and what they can expect um, when they either come to your store or learn more about your business through a consultation. So use this page to help them to see what you offer. 
So in order to add products, you simply click the edit products icon. And then what you would want to do is start to enter the information that the business profile is requesting from you. So they might ask for your product name, the category, a photo. Make sure you put a photo in there. We live in a visual society, so people love to see what they are purchasing. Either put a price or even a price range. I know price ranges are excellent for people who may have service-based business or like a consulting firm. Maybe you have a range based off of that customer's need. So make sure you take that time to lay that out and decide what that would look like. You also have the option to link this product to a page on your website. So if you have a website and people can learn more about a specific product that you're listing, then you can add that link to that page and it'll take them right, right there. So when we look at the message Woodward Throwback sees when it's starting this process, it says that 64,466 potential customers viewed their business profile last month. So that means that over 64K people, potential customers, were able to see their products and it cost them absolutely nothing. That is the type of marketing that we want. That is the type of engagement that we want where we're making impact and all it is costing us is the effort that we put in to put our information out there for the people who need us. Okay, so I have a pro tip for anyone who is on the live today that has a brick and mortar retail store. We have this tool called Pointy and what Pointy does is it has a clever way of allowing you to add your products that are in your store to Google with no manual data entry. I'm sure that has you like, tell me more if this is you. So, so let me tell you more. So let's talk about how Pointy works. So you connect Pointy to your point to sell system. And then that is how it translates information to Google. So if you have a system like Clover, Square, Lightspeed, then what you can do is download the Pointy app and then that is going to in turn add products to Google. And you're probably saying, well, how is it going to do that? So let me explain to you how. Each time one of your products is scanned as you sell them, then those products are added to the Google business profile in a section that is labeled, see what's in store. So as you scan, the products add. Another thing that you can do to get Pointy connected to your business is get a free device. You can order it called a Pointy box. And Pointy, the Pointy box, what it does is it plugs in between your barcode scanner and the point of sale system. But again, the end result is that as you scan those products are added to your business profile and now people are able to see what you have to offer as well as check its stock availability as well and another cool tip is that when you use pointy those products because now they're on your business profile they can also pop up on google search maps and shopping so here are a couple things that you want to think about if you are considering using Pointy. So you want to make sure that you have a permanent physical store that customers can actually come in and visit. You also want to make sure that the products that you have have a UPC or an EAN barcode that you can actually scan at your register. So Pointy is available for businesses in US, Canada, UK, and Ireland. And if you want to learn more or get started with Pointy, you want to visit pointy.withgoogle.com. So we covered a lot in this section talking about the business profile as well as a cool tool called Pointy that you can use if you have a brick and mortar store. So I want you to look at these three next steps that we have. The first one is to set up a business profile if you don't have one. If you're setting up a business profile, give me a one in the chat, a one for yes, I'm setting one up. The second thing that you can do 
is to update your business profile. So this is for all my people who have a business profile already. We talked about so many ways that you can update your business profile. If you are about to update your business profile, give me a one in the chat for yes. And then lastly is Pointy. If you are a brick and mortar store and business and you want to use Pointy and you're getting ready to use it, I want you to drop a one for a yes in the chat. And those are your next steps. That's how we are going to set your business up to be seen by many more people that will we know will result in greater sales for your business. We are going to look at how you'll list your products on Google at no cost, absolutely free through our Merchant Center. It is a great tool for both brick and mortar retail stores as well as online only retailers. So let's talk about Merchant Center. One of the things to remember is that Merchant Center is for those who actually sell a product, a physical product, okay? So what Merchant Center is going to do is it is going to allow you to manage how your in-store and online product inventory appears on Google. So what happens is when you set up that account in Merchant Center, you took the first step to reach in hundreds of millions of people who are making shopping related searches on Google. That's a lot of people. And we want to make sure that you're positioned to be found by those people who are looking for what you have to offer. So in Merchant Center, you can manage the images, the pricing, the description of your products, very similar to the products on your business profile. But you even get to give it a lot more detail where you can note whether things are in stock, limited stock, out of stock and more. So let's go ahead and look at how your products can appear in Google search results. So if you have Merchant Center set up, then your products that you have will be eligible to show up in the search results, similar to what you see on the screen. Here we see an example of product information for Woodward Throwbacks, Salvage Classroom Door, right? So it is appearing here in the search and you can see the details about it. You can see that it's labeled as a vintage antique architectural door, right? It tells you the location of where it's located and it even shows you the dimensions, the price and the delivery time and if it's on stock. So this is a really, really heavy lift of what Merchant Center could do to present all this information about your product that you have through having this information on Merchant Center. So let's get into more details about how to make Merchant Center work for your business and your brand. So let's look at what it looks like in a shopping tab. Drop the explanation point in the chat if you love the Google Shopping tab. I absolutely do. If I'm looking for a certain style of dress or fashion, I love to use that shopping tab to pull up exactly what I'm looking for. So what happens is when people click on a shopping tab, they're going to see page results too. But not all of those different page results are products that are available to purchase. That's what we like to call free listings. But shoppers also have the opportunity to filter their results. So if you are looking for a particular product or service like the salvage classroom door, if you're looking for a specific seller, a product rating or price, then you can filter it by that. So here we have that when you click on the product that shows uh, the salvage door from Woodward Throwbacks, it's showing you additional information about this particular product. So we saw it on the search results. We saw it on the shopping tab. Now, the information that you're putting in about your product can be found on Google Images. So the images, they can be pulled from various sites and it's not necessarily always a product that is for sale. But if the image does show that an item is available for purchase, it'll include a label that's shaped like the price tag. So if you look at the image that's on the slide now, you will see that little uh, product label 
that is what we like to call a product annotation. It means that if you click that, it is going to create a path to get you connected to actually purchase what you're looking at in Google Images. So if someone is interested um, in purchasing a, a vintage door or a rustic door, say they're typing that into Google Images, what will happen is because Woodward Throwbacks has those type of descriptive words in their door product description, that it is possible that their salvage door is going to pop up in the results and it's even going to show that product annotation to make it a million times easier for that person who just searched looking for a vintage door to click on the door and possibly purchase it and know that what they're searching for is actually available and accessible. So this is a high level overview of how Merchant Center works. So the first thing that you want to do is to create an account. But I have some some tips to give you. If you use Google Ads for your business, you want to make sure that you sign up for Merchant Center using the same account that your Google Ads is connected to. So the same email address you use for Google Ads, use that for the Merchant Center. Because one of the many things I love about Google tools and products is they sing and harmonize and integrate together so well. So make sure that you streamline everything by using the same account. The second step is literally uploading all your images and all your information about the products that you have. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in the upcoming slides um, on how you would upload your images and set up your product information. And then lastly is now you just show your products across Google. Um, another pro tip is if you use Pointy that we talked about just not too long ago, it will automatically set up a Merchant Center account for you and create product feeds for you. So again, if you have Pointy installed in your brick and mortar as you scan products, then it is going to create that Merchant Center uh, product feed for you and your account. All right, so let's get into more about setting up your Merchant Center account. So one of the things that you want to think about when you set up your account is where customers are going to go whenever they check out. So if you have a website, they can go to the website. If you have a store, you can mark that they can go um, in store or smaller stores, or there is an option that people can actually buy on Google. So this allows you to showcase your in-store inventory and in Google shopping results that we talked about not too long ago. And then Google can help you facilitate an online sale. You still will need other services like your payment processing and inventory and order management, but it is an option available to you. And it's important that you know that you can change these checkout options at any time. OK, so I want to talk to you about the two ways that you can add products in Merchant Center. I'm sure you all are eager to know how do I get my products added? So the first way is manually. So if you just have a couple of products that you offer, this might be the easiest way to do it. But if you have a large inventory uh, that you want to kind of upload into the system to make things a little bit more easier for you, then you might want to create a product feed, which is a basic spreadsheet. The amazing thing is if you choose option two, which is the product feed, Merchant Center already has a template that you can use and an onboarding guide that walks you through step by step to make sure you get all of the information needed into your product feed so you can in turn upload it into the Merchant Center. So if you have an e-commerce system, meaning like if you have Shopify, BitCommerce, Wix, WooCommerce, GoDaddy, a lot of times these providers have an integration with Merchant Center. So what happens is once you start to add products on your platform, then it'll automatically integrate those products and put them in Merchant Center. What you want to do to determine if that'll work for you is to identify your e-commerce platform and then research what you need to do in order to integrate your platform and Merchant Center together. 
I also want to talk about a couple of guidelines. This is going to help you know if Merchant Center is a good fit for your business. So here are some specific requirements. You have to promote uh, products that are available for direct purchase. You also have to make sure that you provide a secure checkout process and that you're collecting user information responsibly and securely. That's very important. And the other thing is a return and refund policy. Those are three things that are going to let you know if you fit the mold for a merchant center account. So again, those are things that if you don't have it, you can work on now. Um, if you do have it, then you are set to go ahead and set up your merchant center account. So here we have it. The two tools that we just covered were the business profile and the merchant center, two absolutely free tools that can help you increase your brand visibility and even sell your products and services online to the people that are looking for what you have to offer. So I'm going to move into our final section of this workshop. So I hope at this point you are fired up and ready to use these tools that I just told you about, ready to explore them, ready to update your profile, integrate Merchant Center with your e-commerce platform. But I want to leave you with three tips that are going to help you set yourself up for success when it comes to sales for your business. So tip number one is get your web presence, your brand visibility up to date, not later today, but right now, like now we want you to make sure that when people type in your business name on Google, on any other search engine and social media and LinkedIn, you are showing up. Brand consistency is so important. So if you make sure that your messaging is the same throughout the platform, it begins to build your credibility about your brand and people begin to see, okay, I love how they are showing up across all these platforms. 72% of American shoppers said that they are more likely to stop at a store if they could check if a product is in stock. So once again, that can be a piece of information that as we're posting our products that we easily go by, like this is just what I offer. But you have to keep your consumer in mind. They want to know if you have it in stock. So make sure you take that extra step. You could even go as far as to create posts to say that your, your uh, bestseller is back in stock or it's out of stock. Get on our waiting list for it. So be have fun with it. Have fun with your business. But most importantly, get ready for the people. Get ready for your potential customers. So that way they know that you have exactly what it is that they need and they can see it easily. They don't have to do a super deep search for it. They can see it just by searching for your business name or what you offer anywhere. The other tip is to make your payment process simple. So you want to find a way that makes it easy for people to check out. So I want y'all to drop an explanation point in the chat for me. If you didn't complete a sale because it was just like too hard, maybe they made you set up an account before you could actually complete a sale. They didn't have a guest option. Maybe they didn't accept your preferred payment method. You had to type your cards in. That's like me. If I have to get up and go get my purse because I can't use my, my digital, if I can't use my, my digital checkout options, then I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone. You know, we've all been there. And the reality of it is if we take a moment and process the gripes that we have and the pain points that we have as a consumer, then we can easily turn those pain points into fuel for us to create an experience for our customers that is seamless as possible. So when you think about streamlining your online checkout, you want to make sure that it's faster and easier for them to complete their transaction. Maybe you offer customers different payment options, 
uh, to buy your products. Uh, make sure that you have a digital wallet. Uh, the afterpay and things of that nature are very um popular now so just explore those different options so you can make checking out as easy as possible all right now i have our third and final tip which is to make sure that you optimize for mobile and you might be thinking like what what does that mean well really i want you to put your mobile view first listen a lot of us are shopping on our phones like we're scrolling and we see a product or a shop that we're interested in and we click it and and everything is happening on our mobile devices we should think mobile first we want to make sure that our website looks good if someone pulls it up from their mobile device uh, we want to make sure that they can see everything the pictures are clear all of those things matter so if you want to make sure that you are improving your mobile site there is some tools that we have that can assist you to see how a visitor is experiencing your website on their mobile device so at the link here g.co backslash mobile friendly you can go ahead and visit there and you'll be able to look at your website information by just entering your url and to see how your page is actually scoring and how things are showing up from a mobile view so remember our last tip is mobile first and i want to leave with you a tip sometimes when you look at your mobile version on your phone you might say i don't know how to fix that the the word is off the screen and it's not reading a full sentence or the picture is pixelated sometimes you have to go back to your website developer and ask for some assistance so don't be afraid to ask for help if you run into an issue that you're unable to solve all right y'all we cover a lot during today's workshop so i want to go over a couple of resources and a recap of what we have covered i mean did you know that there were so many free ways to tell people about the products that you offer in your business? I'm glad that we have these ways to offer you. I wanna present to you this checklist. And while I'm reading through the checklist, I would love for you to drop what you are going to do next in the chat. If it's all of them, put all of them. But if there is something that really, really stood out to you, we want to know. So when we look at the checklist, one of the things that you can do is create or update your business profile. Make sure you update your info, add posts, ask for reviews, all of those good things. Make sure you go ahead and do that. The other thing is now you want you're getting reviews, you wanna read those reviews, see what people are saying and respond to them. Remember, you have the power to represent your business integrity and your business professionalism when you respond to those reviews, whether they're positive or negative. The other point of our checklist is pointy. So you want to use pointy if you have a brick and mortar store so your inventory can be seen directly on your business profile number four on our checklist is mobile first making sure that the mobile version of your website is easy to read it's loading fast and it is set to optimal engagement for someone who is visiting your website and then point five you want to go ahead and update that online message. Remember those three points that you shared in the beginning that you want people to know about your business? That message should be the same over all of your various channels, whether it's your website, your social media, um, your marketing materials, make sure that that message and those goals are clearly hit. You also wanna make sure that the checkout process is easy for your customers make sure that they don't have any struggle sealing the deal with you and it's in our hands to make sure that we're providing all of the tools that makes it easier for them 
And last but certainly not least is if you have a product-based business, you want to make sure that you're using Google Merchant Center. It's going to display your products in the search results, in shopping, in images. And we also talked about your business profile. So Merchant Center just helps for you to have that well-rounded picture of having your product show up on all of the different platforms and products that we offer at Google. So I hope you already dropped everything in the chat that you're working on on a checklist, but I want to take it a step deeper. Action plan. What is the one thing that we covered today that it was like a light bulb moment for you where you felt like if I do this one thing, this really may help position my business in a better place. Now, I hope that there's multiple things that you feel like that about, but I want you to just pick one and then write your action plan and be specific about it. When's the deadline for you to get this action plan completed? What support do you need? What type of resources do you need to complete it and get it done? I believe that you all can make whatever it is that you wrote down as your next step happen. I want to truly thank you so much for attending today's workshop. It was a pleasure to engage with you all. Thank you again for having me, and we hope to continue to connect with you on your journey to greatness. Thank you so much, Sterling and Soleil. That was an amazing deep dive into tools that we need to know to help our businesses thrive. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, our coaches have been active in the chat. They've been answering your questions. So please keep that coming and we'll keep answering. I do wanna answer one question live. It comes from Belinda Stokes. And it's a very common question. How often should we change passwords? Very, very common concern. And if you are concerned about active security threats, every 90 days is a good cadence for that. And again, keep those coming in the chat and we'll keep answering. And now I'll kick it over to Philip Dunn to introduce our panel. Now, I hope that you all have been capturing the important tips coming from these digital coaches. It's, it's such a game changer to have experts in these areas and entrepreneurs themselves from the community provide direct insights on topics that can change the economic trajectory of a business. Now, my name is Philip W. Dunn, and I'm the Programs Manager and Membership Engagement Lead over at the USBC. And we're about to get started with our small business panel, but before we do, I wanna introduce you to our honorable speakers, starting first with our moderator, Talisha Bekovic. She's our very own Executive Vice President of the US Black Chambers, Inc. And in her role, Talisha works with policymakers to promote legislation that expands small businesses and addresses the unique challenges facing the black business community. She also leads external engagement with corporations and foundations to encourage inclusive strategies on access to capital, supplier diversity, and community investment. Uchenna Unguro, the COO and creative director of CC's Closet NYC, channels the pulsating rhythms of New York City's multicultural landscape in her creative vision. Uchenna's upbringing in the city's vibrant tapestry imbued her with an intrinsic understanding of diversity and self-expression. Now at CC's Closet NYC, they believe that fashion and, and beauty, it can be a celebration of cultural heritage. And they are proud to offer a range of products that draws inspiration from the vibrant colors and the bold patterns of African textiles. And their mission is to empower their customers to feel confident and beautiful in their own skin. Now, our next panelist is Terry Johnson, and she's an entrepreneur and adventurer who brings her experience to life through storytelling and luxury products. Now, during her travels, Terry experienced an array of different scents and developed a passion and obsession for beautiful and evocative fragrances. Now, this sparked an idea to create a luxury home fragrance company inspired by her neighborhood of Harlem, specifically during the Harlem Renaissance period and she founded the Harlem Candle Company in 2014 and now has 24 exquisite fragrances in the collection. Now, Terry's work with some of the world's most innovative perfumers has helped her grow the brand's popularity 
on an international level and has led to the brand's launch in Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom and over 100 boutiques across the country. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Talisha so we can dive right into hearing more from these amazing business owners. Thank you so much for the introduction and happy Black History Month to everyone joining the summit today. I'm so excited to have this next conversation with leading small business owners, Yuchenna Ngudo from CC's Closet and Terry Johnson from the Harlem Candle Company. We've heard a little bit about each of you and your backgrounds. So now let's transition into a discussion to learn a little bit more about your business operations and how you've used Google to help you grow. Let's get started. The first question is for the both of you and you, Chenna, I'll start with you first. Please tell us a little bit more about your business and tell us how you're celebrating Black History Month. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so my name is Uchenna. I am the co-founder of CC's Closet, and this is a women's inspired lifestyle brand that helps um, women express themselves through body care and fashion. Um, this Black History Month, we're going to be celebrating by highlighting um, various of accomplished of Black people in the present day and in the and historically who have had an impact on beauty, fashion, and entertainment. That is a wonderful way to celebrate. And Terry, what about your plans? And also tell us what about your business uh, and how you celebrate it. Black History Month so far? Sure. So I'm Terry Johnson. I'm the founder of the Harlem Candle Company. Uh, the Harlem Candle Company is a luxury home fragrance brand that shares the essence of the Harlem Renaissance through beautiful candles and home fragrances. Uh, for Black History Month, we are giving 10% of the um, proceeds of a sale of our special Black History Month collection to a non-for-profit organization called A Better Chance. And we're very excited about doing that, about partnering with A Better Chance, um, which we feel is just a great initiative for Black History Month. That's so cool because I'm actually an, an alum of A Better Chance. No! Yes. <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah. Thank you to both for sharing us a little bit about uh, what you're doing for Black History Month. So, Uchenna, I'm going to go to you next. Um, I know Google has an array of digital tools for business owners. What do you feel are the most underutilized Google tools by small businesses? And why do you think it's the case that they're so underutilized? Yeah, I feel that, like, when you don't quite know how to use um, a particular um it's kind of hard for you to like integrate it into your everyday activities but I like um having had the opportunity to update my Google business profile um it allows for easy communication with customers so people might not know this but customers can actually message you through the, that Google channel and you can give them easy updates so last year um, there was an unfortunate incident of one of my customer's family members um, passing away and they wanted a specific um, accessory to, that perfectly matched what um, the individual was going to wear to their final resting place. And we were able to very quickly um, find the product for them um, and deliver it for them for that special case and instance. So it's really good for you to be able to have an easy line of communication with customers. I also like Google Ads. Um, I've been a fan since the very first time I started attending Google Digital Coaching Sessions. Um, it's a great way to keep you in front of the eyeballs of customers who are searching for your product. And they also have technology now that allows you to um, upload different types of creative and different types of copy, and it'll select the perfect combination for the customer that's currently viewing your ads. Wow, that is really useful information. And I, I hear you talking about a little bit of AI, so we're going to get to that later. But what about you, Terry? Um, what are you what are you seeing be a useful uh, Google tool in your business? Yeah, so we use uh, Google Trends, which really allows us to help identify those trends in the market, and especially when we're launching new products. 
Um, we also use uh, the Google Keyword Planner, and these are free tools. Um, I have a person who runs all of this, and she is so passionate about it, and she's a master at it. She's figured it all out, but she loves to do that. Now, because we sell candles, and we have some candles that might be very specific for the holiday season, and some candles that might be much more um, appropriate for spring you know there's certain keywords that we will uh, will look at and we'll play with um, people might not be searching so much for floral candles in the in the winter maybe more holiday or pine or cedar or some of those fragrances so we definitely use the keyword planner and we also use um, google performance review uh, sorry google performance planner which helps us to visualize changes so if at certain points, we want, you know, maybe it's more revenue is the goal, and we might be willing to take a little bit less ROAS, return on ad spend, um, which might be just kind of a strategic move that we might want to do at that time. So uh, we love all those tools. I mean, of course, ads, we've been running ads for the longest time, which um, really has been a really fantastic way to connect with our customers, get more eyeballs on the, to come to the Harlem Candle Company, and yeah, it's so far so good. <laughs> so far so good. I love that. And you all are definitely doing so good because we're here showcasing you on today's summit. But everyone watching um, isn't on your journey. And so tell us about how your marketing strategy was when you started in an early stage versus how your marketing strategy has evolved um, digitally to where you are today. In addition to running ads, I think one thing that I've done um, with the help of like Google keyword tools um, has been integrating those keywords into my product descriptions on my website, um, which is so key for making sure that your products do show up when people sh search for you on Google. Um, and additionally, also for blogs, um, I have longer um keyword filled blogs um, that um, help generate and drive traffic to the website so that people can make an informed decision when they just finally decide to purchase. These are very good nuggets, Yuchenna. Thank you so much for sharing these. And Terry, Yuchenna said something that was really resonating with me, uh, representing the 3.2 million Black-owned businesses in the country. Um, most of us uh, Black-owned businesses are sole proprietors. Um, about 98%. And folks need to understand when there's a good opportunity to insource things and outsource things. And so for you, Terry, what parts of your business have you kept management under as an owner? And which ones have you began to leverage digital, digital tools to help you automate? Right. Um, well, Google, Google Ads, Google planning, all of everything, Google, Google analytics. <laughs> um, and I really feel super blessed that I, well, actually I hired a business consultant. So at the time I, it was just me and a few 1099s. And I had a business consultant who knew that I needed a search engine optimization. So we found, um, we found someone who was able to do SEO, but also who really can wear all the hats and do all of our ads, who really understands data, the analytics, and who's very passionate about that. You need someone passionate and excited about that. So having her on board, and I've now been working with her for about four years, and we have a weekly call, we go through, we look at the ads, we look at the performance max campaigns, we decide where we wanna kind of up the budget a little bit here, bring the budget down a little bit here. And so we're constantly tweaking, we're constantly iterating. She's constantly asking me for more assets and user-generated content, which I don't have yet, but I'm gonna get it soon. And we're, we're just constantly iterating. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I had been running this business for a good, four and a half years prior to having someone who was very focused on that. So I knew that I couldn't do it all. There's no way in the world that I can figure out everything I need to do from a digital analytic and ads perspective, but and also do product development, um, sell to all the retail stores I'm in, Nordstrom, Macy's, Bloomingdale, Saks, um, and then continue to just do really cool collaborations with like, the Met, um, different uh, television and, and, and movies. And yeah, so it's that was one part that I was happy to give up. <laughs> That's great. 
<laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And Eugenia, earlier you talked about um, how Google Ads and the uh, integration of AI kind of makes it easier for you to do some of these things on your own. So maybe you can talk about um, why it's important for small business owners, black owned businesses to know the importance of AI and how to leverage it in your business. Um, absolutely. I think that AI can be extremely helpful um, in today's market, especially since like um, we all know that like staff and the cost of like um, having people help us can be quite expensive. Um, one thing I like to talk about AI is just to treat it like an a um, an intern. And when I say to treat it like an intern, I mean, don't give it any more information that you would feel comfortable, you wouldn't feel comfortable with an intern having, but use it to sort of like expedite um, any sort of task that you have um, and make it work faster. So one of the things that um, I use um, AI for as it pertains to ads is to um, do, it's to create content for different sizes. So a lot of times on platforms like Google, you might need like different dimensions for different um, types of displays and like AI is a quick and seamless way to do it all at once. We can use um, a cropped photo that we had or like a vertical photo and generative AI can either expand the photo, it can add um, certain attributes to like the background and you can even use it to switch and swap out um, the backgrounds of products if you have like a product photo. Um, additionally, I think it's an amazing resource for copy. So um, a couple years ago, I had a copywriter that I was like obsessed with and was super amazing um, at writing a lot of like our strongest, the product description of a lot of our strongest um, performers on our website. But unfortunately she um, got recruited into an agency that didn't allow her to run her own business at the same time. Luckily for me, um, that was around the same time that like AI um, was growing and expanding. And I used it to create um, product descriptions and ads that contain certain keywords um, that also, um, also reflect my brand voice as well um, and attract certain clients um, that will have like a higher, um, that will spend more money ultimately and make the cost of advertising cheaper. Absolutely. Um, affordability is so critical in today's economy. Um, so today's workshop is being led by Global Google Digital Coaches who are locating marketing experts, similar to the chambers that we represent here at USBC across the country. And you all have both attended these digital coaching workshops, which are absolutely free for entrepreneurs to attend. And they take place in cities and states all around the country. Can each of you share, um, and Terry, we can start with you first, can you share what you learned from your digital coach and how they helped you um, and just the value of the, the coaching program that um, folks could take advantage of watching the audience? I learned that I needed to hire somebody who, <laughs> who likes it because, you know, you have to, I loved all the tools and I realized, wow, there is so much at our disposal, so much of the stuff that is free and available. And I, I think that's the big, that, that was my biggest takeaway. This is all, I mean, this levels the playing field. This makes it not, not unattainable to actually be able to grow your online business, increase, you know, you know, kind of kill it in the e-commerce space. But in order to do that, you need to utilize the tools. And I knew that there, I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. So I think it was just a wake up call that, you know, I need to get to the point where I can pay someone who loves it and who's going to nerd out with it. And that's what I did. So that was my big takeaway. Find someone who is into it. Right. And there's a lot of people who are. There's a lot of people, they love that stuff. Absolutely. And I, and I love them because they love that stuff. Yeah. So. <laughs> and that's part of being a good leader, knowing when um, it's time to 
uh, delicate and offload things that that folks are better at. And it's part of being a good strength finder. So thank you for that insight, Terry. And Uchenna, for you, um, what are things that um, the Google coaching program has uh, been beneficial for in, in your world? Um, I definitely set up my first account there. Um, back when the digital coaching program was first starting in New York. Um, and I felt empowered attending these sessions um, because it gave me some leverage as a small independent brand. To this day, people um, always comment on how strong um, my Google search ads are pertaining to what they're looking for. And I also enjoyed attending these sessions because it allowed me to network with other Black um, entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs of color. People know that entrepreneurship can be such an isolating experience and being able to be in rooms with someone like a Terry was absolutely phenomenal for me. Um, having been a recent college grad who hadn't had any um, family members or anyone in our network who had um, ever done e-commerce. And so it definitely gave me leverage that I could use to sort of gain a strong foothold um, in the e-commerce space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And networking with other entrepreneurs and learning from their stories is is such a critical part of the journey. Um, Terry, I'm going to ask you a question. You can go back five years or whenever you started your business and let the audience know if you could change anything. Um, Now, looking back, what's one thing you wish you knew about starting your first business that you think the audience should know today? Um, One thing that I probably would have done differently, I would have asked for help sooner. Um, You know, I didn't really, you know, this is not my first business. So, you know, you don't, sometimes you don't want to kind of put it out there too hard because you might not stick with it. And I've been there, done that. So I didn't really, I wasn't a hundred percent convinced that, oh yeah, this is it um, in the beginning. And then, but once I realized it was, oh yeah, this is going to work. And I love this. I go to sleep thinking about it. I wake up thinking about it. I think once I realized that, I probably could have asked for help. So I, I mean, my business is completely self-funded and I've just constantly reinvested the proceeds back into the business. And, but I think I probably could have asked for financial help or whether it was a bank loan or just having a little bit more help so I didn't struggle so bad. Um, But I mean, it also makes me really, really appreciate all of the hard work, but you know, I don't, I don't want people to struggle like I did. (laughs) (laughs) So mentorship, mentorship is important. Um, One thing you can definitely learn about in the Grow with Google program. Um, So Yuchenna, I'll give you an opportunity as well to share some insights. What's one thing you wish you knew more about when you first started your business that you think the audience should know today? Yeah, I think my my um, advice is actually quite simple. I would say create and document a routine and procedure for everything that you do. It makes it easier to explain and to show people how to help you. And you can even use generative AI to like help you create these documents on um Google Docs. And I would also use like a project management tool to sort of like help you track the status of these projects that you're working on. Um, Keep track of these um, SOP documents, standard operating procedures that you've created. And um, it helps you keep track of like where you are on given projects. And I know that like Sometimes as an entrepreneur, you might be working on a project or a task that's 30 minutes. Other times you're working on a project that takes um, you years. And so um, it's really, really important to be able to see where you are and to keep on top of the multiple things that you're juggling at one time. So I think those um, creating procedures and um, tracking them is like a great way to sort of like help you keep your business afloat and get your desired outcomes. Thank you so much for that, Yuchenna. So today we've talked a lot about various tools that businesses can use to grow their digital presence. 
and both of you are having a tremendous amount of success selling online, using various e-commerce tools. Um, Yuchenna, I can start with you first, please. How are you using e-commerce and do you have any best practices about the audience members who want to also look at selling online and leveraging e-commerce in their business? Yeah, so um, a lot of people um, who are familiar with TC's Plaza might have known that we've mainly built our business online. Like Terry, we're self-funded and we didn't um, get any um, fundraising money. So we had to be like scrappy and creative um, to stay in business for as long as we have. Um, I would say like um, the number one thing that you need to be focused on is your marketing, um, which is why tools like Google Ads um, are important. Um, and then also make sure that you um, get your brand messaging across and be consistent. When you're first starting out and you don't have like a large budget, don't be afraid to get on camera. I feel like when we first started, we were so nervous to get on Instagram Live or any live channel, YouTube Live, to get in front of our audience and like talk to strangers. Now it's something that we do almost daily um, just to keep and maintain our um, community and let people know that it's real people behind the brand. Please utilize those free apps. Anything that doesn't cost you money, get in front of that camera, record the content and get those impressions because even if you don't get the highest engagement, you don't pay your bills with engagement. You pay your bills with cash. And trust and believe, whether I get 30 likes or 300, people are on the website shopping because I continuously post that content. And I love your content. I love seeing you. You just make me yeah. smile. <laughs> love it. Note to self, go and follow you, Tennis all her social media. So uh, let's all do that when we uh, log off. We'll go follow Terry as well. But Terry, do you want to share some insights about how you're using e-commerce and some best practices? Yeah. So like you, Chenna said, um, going live, I do a lot of Instagram lives. We've recently, not recently, the last year, we've been using um, a tool on our website that is uh, live shopping. So I kind of set it up. <clears throat> If you can see what's behind in front of me, just a whole bunch of products. And it's almost like QVC style. And I, we have certain products that maybe we've bundled or we've, we packaged perfect for Valentine's Day or perfect for Black History Month. And we'll do, you know, a small percentage off of those products. And it's for available for 24 hours on, only. So we create that um, sense of urgency. And <clears throat> I'll sit here and I'll talk about the products and we'll do product launches or, oh, we only have, 65 more of these. And, and so it's just, it's very engaging. We let people know through SMS. We let people know through uh, our newsletters and on social media to come and join our live shopping. And, you know, we just see a huge bump in sales, but it also gives our customers a great way to be able to interact with us. So they're constantly commenting and asking questions and I'm, you know, responding to the questions. And, you know, we even do a little, a few giveaways during that time because we want people to stay and, and it's just fun. I love doing it. It's like one of the few times in the week that I get dressed up and like, you know, put makeup on, put a little cute dress and jewelry. And it's just fun. I love to be able to connect with my audience because most of our, um, most of our sales are online. Most of our business is direct to consumer and we love it. And, you know, we, we love it. We, and we listen to our customers. They're constantly telling us everything they want. And we listen. And I mean, we, I recently launched the Harlem perfume company, which is, a fine fragrance brand. And that is because our customers kept asking us to make perfume. So um, I love e-commerce. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I can't imagine doing anything else. This is it. This is it. And I'm so sorry that this is it for our panel. We're at our last question. So before um, we close out, I just want to thank you all both for being so uh, transparent and insightful with our discussion today. Um, so last question for you both, and I'm so proud that the U.S. Black Chambers had to be a, had the opportunity to be a part of this um, back in 2020. But Google offers a Black-owned business attribute. 
for uh, Google profiles. And I wanted to ask um, each of you, um, how is important is it to your business that you actually share your story and use it to engage with customers? Yuchenna, I'll start with you first. Yeah, I I love that Google offers this because I think that lately there's been a concerted effort um, for consumers to support um, Black-owned brands. And um, people, I want to make sure that people know that when they do um, spend money with us, that money does circulate within um, our community um, before it um, travels elsewhere. Um, I love the idea of like being able to share the story in our way because um, a lot of people don't know this, but um, over the summer, um, I had a, a shop in Soho um, that um, displayed a gorgeous product. And every now and then <laughs> I'd have a customer walk in and say, does a black person own this place? And um, I feel like, you know, had they've been able to, I mean, these are people just walking by, but have they been able to like look us up online? That badge um, of honor that shows that we're black owned would have been a great um, attribute for them to see that we are actually black owned proudly um, and continuously serve our community. Terry, how important is the story and using it for engagement? It is, you know, when uh, my business really sort of took off in, during the pandemic. So in 2020, that's when everyone was at home and everyone wanted to make their home a haven. And so people were buying candles and just trying to make it as comfortable and as calm as possible. And that was when, you know, we were getting a lot of love on social media and people were asking, is this a black owned brand? And it just really opened my eyes to understanding that, oh, I need people need to know. Cause I, in the beginning, I wasn't putting myself in the, in the post because my brand celebrates the Harlem Renaissance, celebrates a different time period and, and people in this, this era, not me. So then I realized I was like, okay, I have to put, you know, myself a little bit in there more. So they see that, oh yeah, this is a person behind the brand. Um, but I do, I do think it is extremely important, especially because yeah, I, we do have, we have candles, we have perfume, but our stuff is for everyone. And, and there's just a lot of love and, and to be able to continue to share that love through products, through community, through offering more and more things e from an e-commerce perspective is just exactly what I want to do. So. Thank you so much, Terry, Uchenna, for sharing your stories and helping us celebrate Black History Month. This is our fourth annual Black Owned Business Summit hosted by the U.S. Black Chamber in partnership with Google. And it has been such a pleasure learning more about you, your business, and how you are making Black history. Thank you so much to Leisha and our amazing panelists for sharing more about your small business journey and how you got to where you are. This has been an amazing day. I know I was taking notes. I saw y'all in the chat, keeping us really uh, informed and engaged. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I am excited to now turn it over to Chanel Hardy to close this out. Hello, my name is Chanel Hardy and I lead our work here at Google focused on multicultural engagement and civil rights. U.S. Black Chambers, thank you for partnering with us on such an informative event where our DMV digital coach, Sterling, and our Pennsylvania digital coach, Soleil, provided trainings in cybersecurity and selling online, topics critical to the livelihood of small businesses. We even got to hear from small business owners themselves, Uchenna and Terry. You've shared so many helpful tips that I hope those tuning in have written down. If you're interested in more digital coaches trainings happening across the country, please visit grow.google slash digital coaches and usblackchambers.org to stay connected with the U.S. Black Chambers. You can watch this live stream after today on our Grow with Google YouTube channel. Thank you to everyone for joining us and happy Black History Month.